Thank you, Professor Hillman. Um, our third speaker in what is turning out to be a very diverse session um, is Professor Donna Cox, uh, hosted here at Beckman and many other places. Um, it's hard to know where to start with her uh, curriculum vitae as well. Um, she is a uh, professor of art and design. She's the director of the Advanced Scientific Visualization Laboratory here. Um, she's the director of the Vis Visualization Experimental Technologies at the NCSA. She's the director of eDream, the Illinois Emerging Digital Research and Education Arts Media Institute. And as Wikipedia also lists, she is a recognized pioneer in computer art and scientific visualization. Um, my own personal memory of, of uh, while I was a student here, um, I was an assistant at Beckman, and at one point I actually peered in the room that then held the cave, I'm not even sure they still call it that, the advanced sort of virtual reality visualization room, where Dr. Cox and, and, and one, of her, uh, one of her colleagues were both wearing the sort of 3D goggling, and they were basically filming the birth of a galaxy. And what was amazing about it is that they actually had the camera track through the room. So they were watch, not only watching a galaxy hovering in space, they were watching themselves watch the galaxy as this camera sort of zoomed around on 3D tracks. Um, and it was one of the most incredible things. It was what, you know, a true God's eye view of the universe or a Martin Scorsese's eye view of the universe. Um, so with that, uh, I know she's had some more visualizations up her sleeve for today. Um, Professor Donna Cox. What I'm going to do today is just have a dialogue with you about wayfaring our digital universe at the art and science of scientific visualization. When I came to University of Illinois in 1985 as an artist and assistant professor, I was a witness to these wonderful capabilities that were evolving at that time on this campus in supercomputing, computational science, and hooking human beings up to computers like the Mac 1 organizing Renaissance teams as a producer, an art producer, actually getting people together is part of the artwork, research artists, technologists, and the computationalists. But what is computational science, and what does it matter to you? Well, from observation to computation, we have, in this last century, made a move away from the, the just experiments and observation to the third pillar of science, and that's what computational science is all about, constructing, viewing the universe, understanding the universe about us in a digital laboratory of a supercomputer. And visualization is the only way that you can probe into the billions of numbers that these simulations provide. And we as humanity are building these huge portals and caves, and other ways of emb having embodied experiences of these uh, com computations. Why does it matter? Because numerical models permeate your world. If you've flown in an airplane, if you've driven in a car, if you've looked at weather on the Weather Channel, you, in fact, are looking at sim scientific simulations in one form or another, financial models. They help to, in fact, uh, guide, project, and help us to navigate our realities. And in this case, we did a visualization in collaboration with the Argonne National Laboratories to show traffic in Chicago and to try to predict how we would reroute traffic patterns in case of an emergency or traffic jams. Again, a simulation and visualization. This becomes particularly poignant when you think about climate change. Climate change is the only way that we are going to be able to project into the future and understand what sustainability, the use of energy, how we are going to understand what's going to happen to our planet by year 2099 is through computational models and visualizations of those models to understand the outcome. Now, how, what is this computational science? What is the methodology? Well, first, we have something in reality, a phenomenon like a tornado. And we want to understand what that tornado is. Let's say the storm chasers go out and they study a tornado by video. The audio should be up. I don't hear audio, but what is happening here 
is a storm chaser out in the field with a video. They're very thrilled and very happy that they are able to see this video. They study it. They study the downdrafts and the phenomenon. That's what's on your upper left. But on your lower right is a simulation of a thunderstorm developing. It is a numerical model that we have taken into computer graphics with visualization techniques to understand the billions of numbers behind the, con the computation to understand the tornado. But there is an art to this, how we turn these numbers into pictures. It's not just a translation or representation of data. There's a design of digital visual metaphors that I have called visiphors to show through different ways, different visual idioms, different mapping of the process, trying to bring insight into the visuals, uh, into the numbers, and to, so that the visuals help us to probe and gain a better understanding. So this art and science taking uh, and mapping the data is a kind of new scientific semiotic language. And you are becoming more visually literate when you see these kinds of visiphors in media, when you see them online, when you experience them, wherever you experience them, in the cave. And I'll let this one play. Music by Robert Pepps. So what we see here is the evolution in time of this computation. We see trajectories showing the geometric form of air pushing and pulling, getting heated up around a tornado, downdrafts that feed the back of a tornado, and even a secondary tornado that is evolving, coming in like a self-sustaining system, and then going away. How can we even map this? How do we even come up as humanity with the mathematics running these into algorithms and co to computers and then translating these into visuals which that we can understand and to... And, and the amazing thing is it really works. We really understand a tornado better than ever before through these visiphors and the semiotic language that we are developing. Now, we can take those exact visual idioms and we can apply them not to tornadoes but to oceans. And in oceans, we can, it's just a flow of stuff. It just happens to be water instead of air. But in this way, we are wayfaring the data. We are mapping, but it's not just a representation. There's a lot of interpretation and design. There is an artistic choice as well as a scientific choice in creating visiphors. These visiphors are like maps. And maps, geographical maps, have been major signs of our culture. They have been a way that we as explorers explore and way find our environment. And they are invented communication systems maps, language, visiphors, they all play that kind of role in our culture. And they are a way that, in, that we are, in a sense, wayfaring, understanding, probing, but they also have, we've made mistakes with maps in the past. We may be mis making mistakes with visiphors right now, or we may be misinterpreting are telescopic images. Now on the right, what you see here, is a digitally enhanced telescopic image by NASA of the Crab Nebula, the remnants of a supernova. On the left is an 813 raw gigabyte data set of a computational study of the first star forming that supernova, blowing out the gas, blowing out the debris, and eventually the uh, nebula will remain. 
You can't get this time evolving picture of the universe with a telescope. You can only do it with computational science and visualization. So, like with the Hubble telescope, ultra deep field, we see collections, we take a snapshot, we take a static view of the universe with telescopes, and they're like these historical maps in that we're dealing with time, space, projection systems, coordinate systems. But the way you really collapse a billion years into one minute is by running supercomputers and visualizing them. But it's just amazing that we can take our mathematical models, put them into algorithms, compute them, and come up with visiphors that actually emulate our universe, things that we and you and I can never experience with our bodies. You cannot experience that visualization with your body other than seeing it or perhaps going to a museum and experiencing it in a different way. But you're not going to get a, the picture out of a telescope, which is a static image. So our telescopes, our images, our instruments, they are like maps. They not only tell us where we are going, they tell us who we are. And they reflect our material, our social, our political realities. They, in fact, have biases. For example, this image, which Bob Patterson and I did of the first in the internet, 1991 is very US centric. It has the biases of our own culture. It was even co opted and appropriated by an electronic dating site at one point online. It has been repurposed and reused and is still getting picked up on the internet today. But it is a kind of map, a kind of representation with our culture embedded in the technologies and in the visual. So how do we get through this data? We get through it by wayfinding. We get through it by building these virtual tools that we can fly through the data sets and participate in the data remotely from workstations and afar. We take these images, our impressions of what the world is, we calculate, we visualize, and then we put our bodies into these environments. And we spend a lot of money doing it. We build these huge portals from museums. At the American Museum of Science and Industry, we've worked on two space shows with them. And we have controlled their digital dome. What you see in the upper left is basically a dome. You sit in it, projection system all around, rumble seats, and it's right there off of Manhattan. You go into these embodied experiences, and we even controlled that dome and the wayfaring through that data from the cave in this building only a few years ago, working remotely with Carter Emmer that you see there, <coughs> who was inside the dome in New York. So there's other projects that we've worked on. Again, these digital domes are proliferating the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, even the Black Holes Project that we worked on, the advertisement is better than the real thing. We're taking you to this other place in space with digital domes, translating them into different languages, proliferating in museums and science centers, with projection systems to make it seamless, to make you feel like you're really there. And in fact, we're putting your body there to be able to experience these things like projections of stars in the universe or flights through galaxies that you would not be able to experience with your real body, not even astronauts, because we're going faster than the speed of light right there. What Joseph Neshvatal calls this is our immersive intelligence, and it's evolving. Our consciousness is changing. We can see it in our young people on the web, getting these images. These are our, our embodied experiences, which is more real than real. And we set people in audiences. We do it at the Adler Planetarium. 
We've worked on space shows for them, like taking people to the edge of the solar system, a project funded by NASA. We've recently worked with California Academy of Science. Millions of people go into these domes. They put their bodies. They spend 43 minutes. They walk out and have experiences they simply couldn't otherwise have. And the ultimate embodied experience that we've just finished, just been released, narrated by Leonardo DiCaprio. How's that for adding some? Uh, and, but when Leonardo says a trillion, let me tell you, it says it, and you get it deeper, and it is, it's like our eyes are not wide enough. We have to increase the stereo. 5.6 million, uh, 5.6 uh, K, 5,000, 5,600 pixels per eyeball spread out so that you can intensify that experience, intensify, grow our immersive intelligence. But one of the great things about Visifors is that they're mobile. They're what Bruno Latour called immutable mobiles of science. They can not only play in big domes or IMAX stereo theaters, they can go to little domes. They can go to inflatable domes. They can go on your TV screen. They can even go on the web. They can go on television, that's for sure. We're circulating many of these visifors to audiences. They pick them up on PBS or Discovery Channel, just like the project we worked on, Monster of the Milky Way. To show you here a visualization around a black hole in an astrophysical jet that is evolving. And of course, there's print, and it goes everywhere. So visifors work very well in print. Again, immutable mobiles. But there's nothing like the web these days. Nearly 9 million viewers have picked up some of these visifors on the web. Just last year in spacerip.com, they empower the public. Visifors recirculate within these new contexts. They're repurposed for telling your story of the universe. You use them, you pick them up, you appropriate them. And what happens? We have them in dual experiences. Not only do you, can you go to the Museum of Science and Industry and make a two-story tornado, you can also experience it digitally at a kiosk. There's the computationally real, there's the virtually real, but what you're really doing is you are, in fact, recirculating these experiences and having an interdependent, connected construction of this universe. By recirculating them, you are participating, just like with this dialogue. You bring to the table your own experiences. You take away from these either group experiences or visifors online. These are concepts that are very, very big, very connected. When you think of the universe, you have hundreds of years of science that go into these visifors. But you also have the art, you have the technology, you have our very culture and all of its biases. So what I have to say is, do your math, understand where your scientific simulations come from, and recognize that by your participation, you are co-creating this universe. So what I implore you is, co-create responsibly. Thank you. Thank you.